Hey friends, since the other day I was talking about cancer and poor ideas about how cancer works, I thought I'd keep on going with an examination of a bad theory about cancer and explain to you why it's bad. As a bonus, I get to talk about some basic concepts in development, genetics, and evolution, which I hope you'll find entertaining, and which the authors of this terrible theory clearly don't understand. It's called the Atavism Theory of Cancer, and the authors are Paul Davies and Charles Lineweaver, who are physicists who know nothing about biology. We could stop right there. There's a habit of a few particularly arrogant physicists have of pompously explaining all lesser disciplines as mere subsets of physics and dismiss them out of hand. But as Davies will proudly explain to you, they were invited by the National Cancer Institute to give a different outsider perspective on cancer and perhaps provide new insights on how to treat it. I sometimes wonder if the NCI ever regrets that. Anyway, Davies had one idea built around a misconception of about how evolution works, and now every year or two he publishes another paper that reiterates his so-called insight and that rehashes his argument yet again with no real evidence to back it up. The problem is that his premises are faulty and no amount of careful, logical construction upon them will produce a fruitful result. Here's his theory, which is his, and which no one else wants to claim. He argues that cancer represents a reversion to an ancestral phenotype. The cancer cell has shed more recent evolutionary changes that make it more accommodating to multicellular cooperation and has become an atavism using core genes that were optimized for a free-living, single-celled life back in the distant Proterozoic Aeon one or two billion years ago. Cancer cells aren't broken. They've just given up modern trappings and are living a primitive lifestyle. It's a romantic notion, superficially appealing, I guess. It's like the idea that us modern city dwellers all have an inner caveman or cavewoman and we'd all thrive if only we could revert to a hypothetical paleo diet of fire-seared mammoth chunks. Only it's not true. It's built on a 19th century conception of how evolution works, and the premise of the whole theory is false. To explain why, well, I'm going to have to dust off the archives and talk about an old and perfectly valid observation and the collection of interpretations, some of which were invalid to explain it. Here are the facts of life that were first noted in the 18th century. So this is old stuff. Organisms were known to have a hierarchy of similarities. Any fool could tell that mammals, for instance, all had unifying similarities that were not shared with other groups, like mollusks. Further, we could see that mammals had shared features with some other animals, like that mammals and fish both had backbones and ribs. These similarities and differences in morphology were used by Cuvier to, to categorize all animals into four major embranchements, or branches, the vertebrates, the mollusks, the arthropods and annelids, he lumped those together, and all the others, like jellyfish and anemones. Again, any fool could look at the bones of a rabbit and human and see big differences, but also underlying similarities. Likewise, you could examine the skeletons of a grasshopper and a lobster and see a common bow plan and also differences, and that there were even greater differences between a rabbit and a grasshopper. The question was, why? Why do human forelimbs have a humerus, a radius, and an ulna, while rabbit forelimbs have the same bones? Was God just lazy and unimaginative, so you reuse the same blueprints over and over with minor tweaks? This is actually a really interesting question. Why do we see unity of form in different branches of animals? This was before evolution was seriously considered, so descent with modification wasn't on the table yet. But brilliant minds still tried to come up with an answer. The most common kind of answer involved fitting the data to a progressive ladder. God had an idea for a form, and then invented organisms that represented different levels of specialization. It was the result of a rational exploration of morphospace, we might say nowadays, where each step in the ladder represented a different grade in the expansion of the morphology of the branch. These ladders always had European men at the very top, of course, representing the ideal pinnacle. 
There is lots to argue about here, but I'm going to focus on one detail. This was an observation by Carl Ernst von Baer, made in early in the 19th century, that early embryos of different vertebrate species could be virtually indistinguishable. Von Baer was an expert embryologist with the highest reputation, so when he said that he couldn't tell two embryos apart, that was a significant datum. It raised the question, why do embryos pass through such similar stages in development? And I'll discuss two different answers to that question. The first is von Baer's explanation, which is purely an embryological answer and is going to turn out to be the best answer. The second is Ernst Haeckel's later answer, which incorporated both embryology and the newfangled science of evolution, and that answer turns out to be mostly wrong. So let's start with explanation number one, von Baer and what we now call developmental trajectories. Von Baer was a magnificent embryologist, and his answer was both elegant and evidence-based. He argued that similarities were a consequence of a simple principle, that development proceeded from the general to the specific. That is, the first features to appear are universal basic structures, and then only later do the details that are unique to a species begin to emerge. To use an art school metaphor, imagine you're going to draw a picture of someone. First, you'd sketch an oval for the head, and then add a nose and eyes and mouth, and only later add features unique to a specific individual. This is not making a statement about evolution. It's just progressive nature of producing an image. Okay, to continue the art metaphor, I'm going to sculpt very poorly, I'm not very talented at this, two organisms, a fish and a salamander. I start with a couple of blobs of Play-Doh. They're identical, mostly, right? There are only a few ways that a ball of cells might look in early development. Then I roll these out into a tube or torpedo shape. Exciting, huh? Okay, there's our fish. And we do likewise for our salamander. There they are, early embryonic fish and salamander. Once again, at this level, they're still gonna look very similar because we're only trying to get a rough outline. Okay, then we might wanna add a few details. For instance, maybe we want to add some eyes. There are a couple of eyes on our fish. A couple of eyes on our salamander. They're already looking pretty cute. And maybe we could add some other things like, oh, there's got to be a mouth in here, right? So there's our mouth. Another one on this guy. Okay, at this point, obviously, they still look pretty much the same. Only later in development are we going to get divergence. So a fish, for instance, would have a large caudal tail. So we'll just flatten that out, make a caudal fin here. There's our tail. It might have a few other fins. We'll just pinch those off here. Dorsal fins. Oh, look at there. Does that look like a fish to you? Then our salamander is going to do things a little differently. So it's going to form legs. So let's put a couple legs on here. Yeah, it's looking just like a big purple blob, I know. Okay, there we go. We add these other features. And these represent a divergence at this point. So this is the von Baerian model of how this occurs, why they're so similar at the beginning. Von Baer would explain the whole phenomena simply a consequence of how development works. He was a pre-Darwinian scientist, and even after Darwin published, did not accept natural selection as a driving force. 
He did believe in the transformation of species, but he rejected Darwin's mechanism, and he had a set of general rules of development that explained his observation without requiring Darwinian evolution. Here are von Baer's rules, which are still valid. So the first rule is, general characteristics of the group to which an embryo belongs develop before special characteristics. So a spinal cord develops before a pigment pattern. His second law is general structural relations are likewise formed before the most specific appear. So how these features are linked together in the body plan is going to appear first. The form of any given embryo does not converge upon other definite forms, but separates itself from them. So his third law is kind of important too. He's saying that the natural consequence, the natural process of development is one of gradual divergence from a general form. And his fourth law is the embryo of a higher animal form never resembles the adult of another animal form, such as one less evolved, quote unquote, but only its embryo. This fourth law is going to trip up Heckel in a moment. This is good stuff and certainly acceptable to modern biologists. It's the favorite explanation, but it doesn't explain everything. For instance, why do all vertebrates have a dorsal spinal cord and eyes? The best, the best answer there is that they inherited them from a common ancestor, and von Baer did not address that. He also would have accepted that idea, just would have disagreed with a modern understanding of the mechanism. So let's go on to explanation number two. Heckel and recapitulation. After Darwin, we get Ernst Heckel, who is most definitely a fervent evolutionist, maybe even fanatical would be a better word. Uh, he wrote lots and lots of stuff on evolution. He was a fierce advocate of evolutionary theory. And he came up with a different explanation, trying to marry evolution and development a bit prematurely since he did this before we knew anything about genetics. He was a brilliant fellow who had the misfortune to be theorizing in the period after Darwin, but before Mendel's rediscovery, and he got everything wrong. So here's the difference. Okay, here we are back in the art studio. Let's make a salamander. But we're going to build it the Hekelian way this time. So what he wanted to argue was that first, our salamander embryo builds a fish, not a salamander, a fish. So we go through the same rigmarole here. We roll it out into a torpedo shape. There it is. We add a few other features. There's our eyes. Man, googly eyes make everything look like a real animal. Okay, so we got our, our torpedo shape. We got eyes. I'm going to put a mouth in there. And then what's going to happen is we're going to get all those other features. So let's build dorsal fin, pectoral fins. Let's make that caudal tail, that flattened caudal structure on fish. So what Heckel argues is that what we get first is this, a fish. And then to make a salamander, what you do is you get rid of all the non-fishy parts. Or excuse me, the non-salamander-like parts. We turn it into a tube again, and we do things like stick our legs back on. So it's going to form legs, just like a regular salamander. The key thing in any Hekelian model is that we have to have recapitulation. You got to build, you got to build the predecessor state, the ancestral state, and then what you go on and do is modify it to make the current form and hope their legs don't fall off. So there we are. We got our salamander back again. So the key difference between von Baer and Heckel is this. Heckel is saying that almost all heritable modification is by terminal addition of new features. So evolution is a process of accreting new elements on top of the old form. The implication of this model is that embryos aren't just progressing from general morphology to specific details, but they are literally progressing from ancient forms to more modern forms. If this were true, we could study the evolution of an organism just by studying its embryos. 
Conversely, we would look at the stages of development and then claim that there were adult forms, living and or extinct, that resembled those stages and go searching for them. It also implies that whatever the heritable information to build on an animal was, and I repeat, Heckle lived at a time when they had no idea, modern forms retained the information to build ancient ancestral forms. There wasn't any overriding of the old data, it's still lurking there in the core of the cell. It was an engaging idea that captured the popular imagination. You could imagine that all the stages of human evolution were represented in our embryos, from a protozoan, to a cylindra, to a fish, to an amphibian, to a reptile, to a mammal, to a primate, and finally to a human. It was everywhere. Freud used this model. Dr. Spock's baby book was full of it, re regarding children's behavior as pro progression through various stereotypes of primitive behavior. If something interfered with later development, the individual would express these primitive forms called atavisms. But it was wrong. There are multiple problems. The evidence for it was cherry-picked by Heckel, and later observations by people like Michael Richardson showed that even the earliest embryonic stages showed remarkable differences between species. Bill Ballard demonstrated that one very early stage, gastrulation, wasn't conserved at all, but showed substantial variations between species. Most damaging, though, was genetics, and especially Evo Devo. There is no protected core of ancient genes in the organism. All genes are subject to mutation, although essential genes in early development are going to be constrained by natural selection to only change slowly. There is no intact fish genome lurking in salamander cells, but only a vertebrate genome that has undergone substantial gradual change in the last 350 million years. So, chickens belong in the dinosaur clade, but there is no T-Rex hiding in the genome that we can recover by removing the veneer of avian genes. You don't have an inner Neanderthal that can be exposed by erasing all the genes that evolved in the last 100,000 years. Sorry. But let's get back to Davies, Lineweaver, and Cancer, and how it's tied to Ernst Haeckel. Davies freely admits it. So he says, A century ago, the German biologist Ernst Haeckel pointed out that the stages of embryo development recapitulate the evolutionary history of the animal. Human embryos, for instance, develop, then lose gills. Actually, they don't. Webbed feet and rudimentary tails reflecting their ancient aquatic lifestyles. The genes responsible for these features normally get silenced at a later stage of development, but sometimes the genetic control system malfunctions and babies get born with tails and other ancestral traits. Such anomalous features are called atavisms. Okay, sort it's sort of true, except for the bit about humans developing gills and web feet and rudimentary tails, as a reflection of ancient aquatic lifestyles. No, they don't. The genes of cellular cooperation that evolved with multicellularity about a billion years ago are the same genes that malfunction to cause cancer. We hypothesize that cancer is an atavistic condition that occurs when genetic or epigenetic malfunction unlocks an ancient toolkit of pre-existing adaptations, reestablishing the dominance of an earlier layer of genes that controlled loose-knit colonies of only partially differentiated cells, similar to tumors. Uh, colonial organisms are not similar to tumors. Let's dismiss that. The existence of such a toolkit implies that the progress of the neoplasm in the host organism differs distinctively from normal Darwinian evolution. That's remarkable. Evolutionary and developmental biologists dismissed the idea of Hekelian re recapitulation a hundred years ago, but Paul Davies is trying to resurrect it. I guess physics is a branch of necromancy. So let's take a look at a s serious paper published by Davies in PLS1. Uh, here's the abstract. So it says, Cancer is sometimes depicted as a reversion to single-cell behavior in cells adapted to live in a multicellular assembly. 
Uh, that's not quite true. The only people who depict it that way are Davies and Lineweaver. Uh, if this is the case, one would expect that mutation in cancer disrupts functional mechanisms that suppress cell-level traits detrimental to multicellularity. Such mechanisms should have evolved with or after the emergence of multicellularity. Okay, that's, that's actually a good statement. I, I approve of this. Uh, they're making a prediction based on their hypothesis, and this is from a paper that's going to test that. So let's get specific. He says, this leads to two related but distinct hypotheses. Somatic mutations in cancer will occur in genes that are younger than the emergence of multicellularity 1,000 million years ago. And two, genes that are frequently mutated in cancer and whose mutations are functionally important for the emergence of the cancer phenotype evolved within the past 1,000 million years and this would exhibit an age distribution that is skewed to younger genes. Okay, again, that's a sort of specific prediction. Not too specific, a billion years is a big window. So they're predicting that if they look at genes that are mutated cancer, the most frequently damaged genes will be less than one billion years old. Their method in this paper is to search an existing database of genes that have been implicated as causal in human cancers and compare that to how old they are evolutionarily. In order to investigate these hypotheses, we estimated the evolutionary ages of all human genes and then studied the probability of mutation and other biological function in relation to their age and genomic location for both germline and cancer contexts. We observed that under a model of uniform random mutation across the genome, controlled for gene size, Genes less than 500 million years old were more frequently mutated in both cases. Okay, this is where they're reaching a bit. The first thing they're doing is they're just, they're just looking at any kind of mutation recorded in these particular cells. They do find that young genes are mutated in cancer with a higher frequency than a model of uniform random mutations predicts, which is not too surprising since lots of genes are involved in cancer and since, and since mutations with phenotypic effects are not going to be randomly distributed. He continues, paradoxically, causal genes defined in the cosmic cancer gene census were depleted in this age group. Okay, I have, I have to rephrase that to make it clear. What they found is that genes that are implicated in causing cancer are not found in the youngest age group. So they discovered that more old genes were mutated in cancer. They claim that this is paradoxical when it's actually simply the opposite of what they predicted. When we used functional enrichment analysis to explain this unexpected result, we discovered that cosmic genes with recessive disease phenotypes were enriched for DNA repair and cycle control. Okay, yes, anyone with any knowledge of cancer would have told them this. Common cancer-causing damage is to genes involved with regulating the growth of cells and managing repair of DNA damage. These are really old genes, by the way. They're present in single-celled bacteria. At this point, the appropriate response would be to say that their prediction is shown to be false and their hypothesis is rejected. But no, they have an excuse. Okay, there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff here. I'll just zip through it. The non-mutated genes in these pathways are orthologous to those underlying stress-induced mutation in bacteria, which results in the clustering of single nucleotide variations. Cosmic genes are less common in regions where the probability of observing mutational clusters is high, although they are approximately twofold more likely to harbor mutational clusters compared to other human genes. Our results suggest that this ancient mutational response to stress that evolved among prokaryotes was co-opted to maintain diversity in the germline and immune system while the original phenotype is restored in cancer. Reversion to a stress-induced mutational response is a hallmark of cancer that shows that allows for effectively searching protected genome space where genes causally implicated in cancer are located and underlies high adaptive potential and concomitant therapeutic resistance that is characteristic of cancer. Wow, okay. That's a whole lot of rather opaque noise. Uh, let me boil it down to simple English. There's a phenomenon called stress-induced hypermutation where bacteria in difficult environments dial down DNA repair basically gambling to induce mutations that will allow them to escape their desperate straits. 
So the fact that cancer cells have lots of mutations that don't fit their prediction, that's important, they, their observation did not fit their prediction, is explained as an atavism. You see, those cancer cells, they're just, they're going back to an earlier state and triggering lots of random mutations, creating noise that obscures a signal they hope to see. In other words, it doesn't matter what result their analysis gave. It's still an atavism. This is bad science. One more bit of evidence about how out of touch these guys are. In order to make their case that cancer was a byproduct of Hegelian re recapitulation and that cancer itself was a Hegelian atavism, they made a video for the public to lay out their model. This is a good thing for a scientist to do. Yeah, please do explain it in lay terms for a public. And doing it in a YouTube video, uh, I don't know, where who's done that? Uh, I guess lots of people have done that. Anyway, it's a good thing that they're trying this at least. But the video itself is hilarious. It's so badly done. I will show you an excerpt, but first I'll remind you of the obsolete Hekalian vision of genetic information in the genome. That it's layered, that there's an ancient core that everything is built around, and that more recent evolutionary additions to the heritable information are more prone to change. Got it? Okay. Now watch Charlie Lineweaver explain how their model worked. So each layer of capabilities is built on and depends upon the earlier layers. Now, I'd like to do a demonstration of what that means. So here I have an, an onion, and let's suppose that this is your DNA, and an onion has layers. So let's take our chopping board, take our chopping board, and this is the D your DNA, and over the course of your lifetime, it gets damaged by overreactive oxy oxygen species, or ionizing radiation, or, oh, well, let's say some carcinogens hit it, and anyway, so it gets damaged. And then, let's have a look at the cross-section here. The cross-section shows that the outside has been damaged, but the inside is still intact. Unfortunately, this onion, is, this onion is rotten to the core, so it doesn't really describe what I'm trying to show. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> so that was the model of the onion as your DNA. Jeez, guy, get another onion and do another take. That was embarrassing. <sighs> of course, it's also a perfect example of the flaws in their thinking. They think that somehow there is a protected core of ancient genes that are not affected by mutations, that are only going to affect more modern genes. That is not the case. The genome is not like an onion. Cancer researchers already know that genes affected by cancers are not correlated with the geological era in which they originated. That, for instance, key genes that are damaged in cancer are those that regulate growth, that control the mitotic cycle, that sense DNA damage and repair it, or that mediate sensory signaling in the environment. These are all ancient functions. Their data doesn't support their hypothesis, and they could only come up with this hypothesis by being totally unaware of decades of work by serious cancer researchers. I'm not a cancer researcher, but I am a basic biologist. Davies and Lineweaver also have to be utterly ignorant of some general knowledge of the history of ideas in biology. What's interesting is that the only other people I've encountered who are this confused about the ideas of Heckel and von Baer are all creationists. And even they love the fact that a well-known early evolutionary biologist was completely wrong about evolution and development. Davies and Lineweaver are touting him as being correct. So Paul Davies and Charlie Lineweaver are more wrong in this matter than young earth creationists. That takes some doing. That they can be that wrong and still get funding from NCI is even more impressive. <laughs>